So if you look back at the orange revolution, the subject of four, we have not just a case of people being killed, even no serious case of, you know, like, you know, like fighting on the streets. It was extremely peaceful. And uh, the last one is not peaceful at all. And I also remember my personal feelings when this first killing, killing of the protest happened. I, I do remember this date probably yeah, till the end of my life. It was 22nd January 2014. I would say it was kind of a turning point in Ukrainian history because for the first time you have person killed during the political manifestation. Of course, there were journalists, politicians, whatever killed before, but it was not during the mass protest. It was a very different story. Yeah. Okay. And then in a couple of weeks we have much more killings, as we know. At first with the Maidan, and then later on in. Donetsk, Kluvansk, Crimea, and so, so, so on. Now, if you look back at the history of Maidan, it is relevant to think that many times, at least like three or four times, this movement that started in uh, late autumn 2013 came to kind of a dead end. The story is dead end is kind of, you know, tricky here because there was no like actually deaths, but dead end. What happened then? And then, like, to move further, you need kind of viral stage again. So it was always violence in different forms that like, made the story to go on, which is a very like, interesting. And if you could remember, the formal reason to start this entire affair was the uh, decision of the former president Yanukovych not to sign uh, the so-called association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union. In fact, as we know now, this agreement was an economic document far away from, you know, like, deep whatever integration project. But the real trigger for my dad was not actually this decision, it was the fact that it happened like next week when the police suddenly uh, decided, it is still kind of a mystery who exactly decided to do that, so decided to beat up the students who gathered in the center of Kiev to protest against the non assignment of the agreement. And actually, this violent act became the real starting point of the Maidan. So not the you know, decision itself, but this like police violence against young people. And then we have next stages, next stages up to killing on uh, Groshevsky Street and on the uh, What's also interesting that when you have attempts, if you wish kind of global European attempts to stop the violence and to give some solution, they also failed kind of because of this incredible violent story. As you probably remember, there was an agreement already signed by a former president and the ministers of foreign affairs of Poland, Germany, France, and a special representative of the Russian Federation in Kiev. And it was about like the stop of violent acts and the presentation of elections to be held in December and so on. So, but protesters said it's not enough, we don't need it, because it, it was after the killings on the Maidan. And it, like, it never became a real story. So, What's interesting here that uh, if we look back again at those events, I will put it this way that uh, the protesters uh, in Kiev they usually reflected to Europe and the European Union, but not to the European Union of 2013 and 14 that we had, actually, but to kind of a mythological Europe. Mythological Europe was a place of space, of room of war human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, economic prosperity. And this European mythology is very important. It has very little to do with the European Union itself, really, on both sides, I would say. But still, what's amazing here, I think it's, it's reasonable for us, for us here, to ask ourselves. Is it just a coincidence that exactly in the year of 2004, when the Orange Revolution happened, yeah, exactly this year, we have this huge EU enlargement. Yeah? So we have Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, so one of the ex Yugoslav states, and three post Soviet republics, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, becoming the members of the EU. And now think about it, it happened in May, 1st of May 2004, and that same year, but later, in the autumn, you have the Orange Revolution in Kiev. And what we say, oh my god, was the Orange Revolution a kind of belated cashing up of the revolution of 1988? But anyhow, it happened right after this big enlargement. And when the revolution kind of came to kind of a victory of success, because the president Yanukovych did not become president over there, and we have a different president, actually, this orange president, Yanukovych, but from the very beginning, you said him, 
no way, no chance to give or to get from us a clear perspective of European Union membership for Ukraine. And actually, some of you mentioned this point in regard to Serbia, Bosnia, and whatever. You have actually more or less the same, let's say, technologically, the same story. You have aspirations of the country, in this case Ukraine, to become a full member, and you have the EU who will say, I don't know, about maybe, maybe this Austrian agreement, kind of economic cooperation, whatever, some borders, and that's it. And what's even more amazing, I would say, that on the one hand you have this very cautious attitude, on the other hand you have Russia's, if you wish, Kremlin's perception of the events, according to which, actually, even this association agreement is a kind of a enlargement by, by different means. So, I would propose to look at the same document, or the same, let's say, project, in a very different way. So, in the eyes of, so to say, Putin on, and his people, it was a completely different story than the eyes of the Brussels and the European bureaucracy. And what happened then, no more or less. So, in 2004, Russia officially acknowledged the results of the Orange Revolution, Maybe I should also remind you that the first foreign trip of President Yushin goes to Moscow. So he went to Moscow, he went to Putin, they signed some documents, but of course the problem remained. Like, what will happen to Ukraine next? And in the case of the last Maidan, 2014, of course, we have the story of, at first, indirect and later on pretty direct Russia's intervention. Now, why it's important? I think it's important, first of all, for uh, for the global order for sure, but for the Russian itself as well. So my idea is that by uh, doing this, and especially of course by doing the Crimea story, uh, Putin found a new legitimacy for his regime. So in, our, in fact, de facto, we have a different regime of the same guy. Starting from March 1st, <laughs> when Crimea became part of the Russian Federation. And it was a new legitimacy both internally and externally, and then we say we could read this project in a kind of this, you know, current Schmittian idea of sovereign and state of emergency. So when we have state of emergency, a true sovereign could forget about war or international or whatever and could just do what is better for his country, for his people and whatever. And actually you should know that Karl Schmidt is pretty popular in Russia. And there are also some Russian philosophers like Ivan Lin, for instance, who was really kind of a Schmittian type of guy in Interpol Europe, and he is a big hero in this official narrative. Now, what we have here, we have a kind of a conflict, if you wish, or a, or a dialogue even, between international law logic on the one hand, and the logic of historical justice, or state of emergency, or something like that on the other. And that's very important. And this, I would say, is one of the biggest challenges for the world order, or global order, if we wish. Now I'm coming to conclusions very quickly. So if you think about Ukraine itself, I believe that the most interesting questions for today, let's say, is not even like the nature of Maidan, but the miracle, if you wish, as I put it in my abstract, of uh, Ukraine's survival in 2014. Because a lot of people, not just in Kremlin, believe that Ukraine will not survive. After Crimea, after the war in Donbass, after economic crisis and all this, after problems with Gazprom, yes, Russian gas, oil, whatever, but it survived. And my kind of intuitive idea that it survived because of or due to the structures and institutions that were and still are stronger than Maidan, and those structured institutions quite often they are informal, so they're not formal institutions, like legal institutions, they're kind of informal economy, corruption. Uh, different types of you know, personal relations and so, so on. And it's still amazing that our civil society, of course, in all like in bad and, and good uh, parts of it, and they kind of save the country despite all the story. Now, if you look at Russia, I would say that one of the biggest questions uh, after the Crimea is more or less, could put more or less like that. How Russia could, if at all, exit this kind of state emergency? when it kind of came during the events, when it questioned international law and when it started speaking about historical justice. If you talk about the European Union, it's pretty clear that uh, we could talk about the lack of any strategy in 2004, in 2014, and our days, but still, despite that, if not, coming, not looking back at Ukraine, uh, you could say that at least I see no 
clear, visible geopolitical alternative to the so-called European project. So it's just the only option. And that's really interesting. So, in fact, it could be probably again compared to the story of Bosnia yeah, and, and Serbia to some extent. And even if you have some sentiment, you know, uh, related to the guy on the t-shirts I mentioned earlier. And the last point, uh, I think that this entire uh, story of Maidan, Crimea and Donbass war put a very big and important challenge before all of us historians and social sciences. Because I agree with my Russian colleague, Ilya Gerasimov, who wrote, actually even before the Crimea, annexation or presaidinenia or whatever you call it, yeah, reunification, that historians are largely responsible for the very fact that the language of historical justice of historical rights replaced the language of international law and international agreements. And I think we should be aware of this responsibility any time we talk about this ongoing uh, situation in Eastern Europe. Thank you very, very much. Uh, 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 critics uh, 
the, the supporters they say it is a, a complementing to the order, and the, the, the critics would say it is an illegal order, or also undermining the executive order, which triggered a, a hot debate in international arena. So uh, what we see, this is uh, actually inside of, uh, inside of this debate, there is uh, two concepts, of two different democracies. And let, me see, let, let us to see what happened in the United States. Uh, for instance, uh, President Bill Clinton, the Union Enforced Union Address mentioned about automatically the best strategy to ensure our security and build a Europe peace is supported against the democracy elsewhere. So it's very connected with the current debate on the, the so-called li liberal international order or the illiberal international order that currently happening uh, in the international arena. And uh, uh, Julian Bush made a similar uh, um, speech after the military operation uh, succeeded uh, in 2003, as a Democrat peace theory in practice. Um, Obama, uh, he continued the same line uh, in the UN General Assembly in 2013 and after that as well. I don't have time to read all, I just give you a image of the line of perception evolution after World War, uh, Cold War. So you can see now we compare how the Chinese leaders, they express their perception toward international order. And the first leader after Cold War was Chiang Zemin, he made his speech in 2000, uh, in, in the UN Assembly. He's talking about, very interestingly, he's talking about the democratization in international relations. So you can compare the previous American president's talk and talking about the, the democracy, uh, uh, liberal, in the national order, must be the democratic, uh, in the, in the domestic uh, uh, governance based on the, the, the US model. So the, the second leader of the war, Hu Jintao, he continued the same line. And now the current GDP president, Xi Jinping, he also continued the same talking about the democratization in international relations. And that will be the basis for the stability of international order. So you can see the, can, can this, 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 this version of the perceptions between the Chinese leaders and the American leaders, the intellectual basis are quite different. <clears throat> So now we just uh, use this uh, um, uh, simple <coughs> chart to uh, compare the two versions uh, to understand two perceptions of democracy and international orders. Uh, we need inside out uh, and all out, outside in two, two ways to see this. Uh, we now see how democratic nations can be religious in international affairs and in general democratic first, it must be done first. And then international order will be uh, state international will be will, will follow. So this, this is the basis of liberal international order thesis. And then, uh, some of them, uh, some uh, some uh, more uh, uh, advanced uh, the the democratic peace theory as well. Well, you can see that the Chinese understanding they uh, put the priority for the national sovereign based international order, more conservative uh, version of international order understanding. The key, the so they see as the key external environment for internal order stability, and particularly for developing countries. So democracy in position destabilizes international order. This is the understanding. <clears throat> so uh, let's let's uh, uh, track the American elites, including establishment and private establishment and intelligence elites, how they evolved. They did not reach the liberal international order vision suddenly. It is a gradual process. They have a lot of internal debates. I've been in the United States for quite long as well. I witnessed this, this debate as well. You see, the collapse of the Cold War, and there is a book, a very famous book, The Get of History of Man. And they're talking about it, the, the US model would be the last model, and the history would end here. So, but at that time, when Bill Clinton was in power, the, this liberal international order was not the dominant discourse in American official uh, uh, ideology of like that. But what happened then was that September 11 um, was a very big turning point uh, that the liberal international order was the, uh, uh, became as a, when, uh, as a dominant, uh, probably the dominant uh, discourse in American 
uh, foreign and international engagement. So now let's go to the zoom, zoom in into the region. We talked about uh, the intellectual differences. Now we zoom in into the specific case of North Korea. North Korea, for many uh, areas, that is the more folks on the North Korea itself, or North Korea, China, North Korea, US relationships. But my, from my understanding, if we would like to understand it, the, um, some 20 years, the development of North Korean nuclear crisis, uh, fundamentally, there's two different understandings to an international order uh, to kill war. So it is very clear, closely connect with Chinese perception toward a non-proliferation system. The non-proliferation system. So after the Cold War, in the 1990s, China had an expectation of the multi-polarity international order. Um, US-Russia relationship improved, and they advanced the nuclear disarmament treaties. So for the China, they expected to make um, less nuclear weapons, because China ha has a smaller uh, nuclear arsenal if compared with American and Russian. Uh, nuclear arsenals. So uh, China joined this system very actively in 1990s. It joined the NPT system in 1992, and then it, uh, uh, I, I talked with the Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Disarmament uh, Bureau. Uh, uh, until 1997, there was no Disarmament Bureau. The, in 1990s, very actively joined these uh, international uh, norms and, and, and regime. But what, what happened and in North Korea, the first nuclear crisis, because of China's expectation of mountain and polarity, did not involve too much. So it, it basically, it's, it's a, it's a, a new, it, it must be denuclearized, and North Korea would uh, uh, gradually uh, come back to the uh, international community. And uh, at that time, of course, China-US relationship also improved a lot. Uh, what happened? Uh, uh, what changed Chinese perception to international order and NPT system, uh, in particularly? I think the turning point happened here in Belgrade in 1999, when the NATO bombed the Chinese embassy here, which really changed uh, the perception of Chinese uh, establishment's perception toward international order and nuclear system as well. Uh, it is a background I think that it's not necessary for me to repeat uh, because of NATO uh, redefinition's mission to celebrate the 5th anniversary and, and, and uh, in, intervention in Bosnia in 1995 and in Kosovo in 1999. And China saw the international stress stability, it undergone a fundamental change and the disarmament process stalled after Russia and the U.S. and Australia relationship also became more tense. So the same year, the same year of the bombing, uh, the China North Korean relationship they recovered. They did not meet for almost one decade. Suddenly, they became closer. And China also changed its uh, perception to a non-proliferation uh, system. Uh, but they, um, what happened later is, is uh, the September 11 that uh, happened, uh, which uh, was viewed by China as a strategic opportunity to focus on its development because the United States' strategic focus shifted from the uh, rising power to the so called rogue states like Iraq. Uh, so the United States, because it fought fighting in Iraq, so it did not want to have another war in Eastern Asia. Um, so the United States uh, approached the Chinese to initiate six party talks to manage this uh, regional crisis that was happening on the six party talks. This process uh, lasted for five years, 2003 to 2008. <coughs> and very interestingly, they reached the historical breakthrough in 2005. The, the, the six parties issued a joint statement. This joint statement, not only the United, uh, North Korea denuclearized, but also the United States promised to uh, establish diplomatic relations with North Korea and guarantee does not attack United, uh, North Korea. And then uh, 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 Japan and, and 
also long right relationship with North Korea. So this is very interesting because China is thinking about the restructuring of regional order, the international regional order that makes to make more equilibrium, diplomatic equilibrium in the peninsula to improve the overall strength, uh, uh, stability. Some people they misunderstood the uh, they misunderstood the, the, the success of 2005 and 2007. Uh, thinking that uh, uh, this is a denuclearization success because of great power concept. But uh, I personally think this is a, is a, a very uh, misleading uh, understanding. Uh, the United States uh, uh, expect China to curtail uh, North Korea uh, to denuclearize and to uh, organize alliance to punish uh, North Korea. But the Chinese, yeah, of course, they would like to they do not want to see the nuclearized in North Korea. But at the same time, they would like to check and use the six party talks so that they can check American unilateralism. So that is their uh, differences in uh, perceiving the international order. And a lot of that, okay. uh, after that, you see, from 2009, these protests are adjusted, and uh, uh, until now, these protests never come back. Okay, my time is running out to me very soon. Now, any new trend from last year, everybody knows, uh, uh, this year, actually, 2018, a uh, lot of change uh, came, and uh, Donald Trump we met in Singapore, and came out with China for three times, and never been here. We've been to China uh, after he took part in 2011. Let, but uh, uh, I think uh, the uh, fundamental intellectual Foundations is still remain very fragile. Uh, the, whether these new chances will really lead to the new uh, mutual understanding or the breakthrough in the Brandy arena remains to be seen. Okay, I think I do not have enough time, so I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, when I applied for this uh, conference, I wanted to add another break uh, for the relation of studies. And this break is talking about the diaspora. There were many speakers before who mentioned this term before. But uh, maybe it's time to look at it, uh, I would say, broadly, and to see what is the importance it can have uh, for this kind of uh, relations. Two observations first. Many countries face the issue of diaspora, uh, not only because there is a huge number of people who live abroad, this is the case for India, this is the case for China, this is the case for Mexico, for many countries. And the second thing is that all the migrants that you presented before, many of them will become the diaspora in the future. So it means that even if today this is not uh, considered to be an important issue, as long as these people establish their presence abroad, as long as they believe that they will never come back, or maybe they will come back to a later stage, they will form the diaspora. So, for countries, especially concerning Lebanon, for instance, where you have more people living abroad than within the country, this is becoming a very hot issue from the economic and from the political point. So the point that I'm uh, going to talk about here is the unique uh, experiment that we had in this region, which was the Council of Diaspora from 2001 to 2003, which has been established in Belgrade. And at that time, the country was called the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, consisting of two republics, Serbia on one side and Montenegro on the other side. So they decided to set up this Council of Diaspora for one uh, very simple reason. 
It was just after the NATO bombing of Belgrade, and the question was to know how can diaspora contribute uh, for the building of these uh, two republics, that is Serbia and Montenegro, what could be their contribution to this? So, at that time, there were a certain number of assumptions. So I'm not so sure if they're still valid, but the assumption was to say that the country or the countries cannot be built by the people who were ruling this country before, in the sense that they are coming from a communist framework and in politics, they are not used to a multi-party democracy and economic terms, they are not used to a market economy. So how can we expect that these people can transform the country? So this is why they are thinking about the help coming from the diaspora in order to make the transition uh, from a communist government or a communist country to something which is a liberal one from the political point of view or a market economy from the economic point of view. So this was the assumption at the beginning in 2001 in order to see why should they do this kind of thing. And in order to answer this, there were the political and the economic answer. The political answer is to say that the people who live abroad they are living abroad for quite a long time, as you know, the immigration from this area has started at the end of the 19th century. So it means that in 2001, there were several generations of people who were living abroad. And many of them were living in democracies. So we have generations of people who know what democracy is. So it means that if they can help the transition of this country from, let's say, a, a communist country or from a one-party system to a multi-party system. There's people from abroad, they know what it is and they can help. And many of them also participate in the political life of the countries where they live in. They are an integral part of the political life and some of them are also MPs or they are representatives in the countries where they live in. So it means that there is a political competence, it means there is a political expertise of the people who live. Concerning the economic side, since they live abroad for a very long time, it is also the same result. They build companies, they are working in big companies, and they may help there's big companies who go to these countries in order to establish a presence through the foreign direct investments. So they're relying and they wanted to capitalize on the diaspora from the political point of view, concerning the transformation and transition of the country, and from the economic point of view, in order to bring money when they are coming back. And the last thing is the remittances. So the remittances is the amount of money which is sent every year by the people who live abroad back home. And uh, this amount of money is extremely significant. The two biggest diasporas in the world that we have, that is the Chinese and the Indian diaspora, every year they send back home about 60 billion dollars each. 60 billion dollars each, this is not a loan. You don't need to repay. This is a gift. This is like a check. They're giving you a check every year, 60 billion dollars, and you don't have to repay for that. So, when you have countries that receive this amount of money, they are thinking twice about the engagement of this diaspora within the life of the country. So, of course, in this area, we don't have 60 billion dollars. We would like to have it, but it doesn't happen. I was looking at the latest estimates, which are given by the IMF and the World Bank. And uh, for the moment, I just have the figures here. Serbia is the biggest receiver. Serbia receives more than 3 billion dollars per year. There's 3 billion dollars per year and present about 8% of the total GDP of the country. So it means that it is a significant uh, 
input, especially when we compare it to the FDIs coming from abroad. And in the same year, I was looking at this, the FDIs represented 6.95%. So it means that the amount of money in 2016, which came from abroad, from the diaspora, was higher than the total investment of all countries in Serbia from abroad. So it means that, relatively speaking, diaspora is much more important than the FDIs which are coming from abroad. And we have not the same thing in the other republics. I will just mention Croatia. Croatia receives about uh, 2 billion dollars, but uh, this 2 billion dollars represent only 4.5% of the GDP. And the biggest percentage is for Bosnia Herzegovina, where the diaspora money represents 10% of the GDP. What is also interesting to mention here is that there is also the outward movement. The outward movement is the remittances from Serbia going outside. And this is something that in the press here in Serbia, they will never talk about. They will only talk about the inbound, but they will not talk about the outbound. And the outward money from Serbia from the same year was 1.3 1.3 billion dollars. So Serbia receives about 3.2 billion and gives out 1.2 billion. And who receives this money? Mainly Bosnia and Croatia. So it means that we have an exchange of money between the three republics, Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, in terms of diaspora, because we have the diaspora, we have Serbian diaspora here in, uh, we have Bosnian diaspora, or Serbian diaspora from Bosnia here in Serbia, we have Croatian diaspora in Croatia, so automatically there is also a flux of money which is going on there. So in order to finish with this, 2001, we established the council. The council consisted in 22 persons, 11 persons coming from abroad, and 11 persons coming from within the country. And when we talk about the reconciliation, I remember that yesterday my colleague Prevoye was talking about the two kinds of diasporas, the political diaspora and the economic diaspora. And he was right to mention them. In fact, there were four ways of people getting out of the country. And the true ways that he was talking about was the political and the economic diaspora. Within the council, they try to put every parcel of the society that we have here. So there was one representative of uh, the Orthodox Church. It was the Archbishop Lavrentiev from Shabbats. We have a representative from the Chamber of Commerce, the President of the Chamber of the Commerce. We have the President of the SAN, that is the Serbian Academy of uh, Science and Arts. So we have 11 representatives from the country representing all parts of the society. And we have 11 representatives from abroad. So there were 22 persons, and they were gathering here in Belgrade in order to talk about the way how all these people who live abroad, according to the estimates, and we have large estimates, from 2.5 to 5 million people from Serbia who live abroad, the question was, how can they contribute in order to rebuild this society after the wars and after the NATO bombing? There were many challenges, and there were also some, uh, let's say, advancement in this. First of all, concerning the challenges, we had a problem concerning the citizenship, because there's people who live abroad, they usually have a foreign passport, they usually have a foreign nationality. So the question is, if they come here, or if they invest here, they will invest under the non-residential status, and not with the residential status. So will they have the same protection concerning the investments? I'm sorry to talk about economic issues, is because I'm coming from a business school. <laughs> so this is why I have this tendency to talk about money. So there was a question concerning the citizenship, 
Another question was concerning the voting rights. And this is a big problem concerning Lebanon. We have more Lebanese living abroad than within the country, but Lebanon doesn't want to give citizenship to all of them, because they know if they give them citizenship and if they participate in the elections, they can completely modify the results of the elections. And in that case, they would say, we cannot accept this. And the basic problem that we have concerning the political implication of the diaspora is to uh, return the motto that we used to have for the American Revolution, which was saying, no taxes without representation. But here, they interpret it the other way. They are saying, no representation without taxes. Meaning, if there's people from abroad, they don't pay taxes here, they cannot participate in the political life here, because they don't live here. What is the commitment to this country? Only if they pay taxes here, they have full legitimacy to participate in the political and the economic process. So, we have several issues for that. I'm uh, sorry, I think that I'm exceeding a little bit time. And uh, if I am entitling this, uh, this is not a paper. I didn't present it yet. It is just a discussion that we can have here. If the title is the empirical uh, study of this, there is a reason for that. Because I was the president of this council. So I know the story from inside. <laughs> That's enough for today. If you have some questions, I will be very glad to answer them. conceptualize them in the paper 
which I'm presenting here to you today. And if we are right, um, then we probably kind of you know, have a trade-off in political peace building, as often kind of we are dealing with constitutional oligarchies in these cases, that we, we establish either democracy or peace, but not both at the same time. Um, I have four points for, my, for this discussion. Can you first the constitutionalism and the critique thereof, then the application to non-democracies, uh, concept, conceptual challenges, and last but not least, I would like to empirically map constitutional regimes. Um, so, constitutional democracy was introduced by definition by R. and Leipart as a democratic regime type. Um, his empirical argument would be that in heterogeneous society only a constitutional regime can be a stable democratic regime. Let us try to define what consociationalism or power sharing, the two are used kind of, you know, um, as essentially interchangeable terms. People prefer today power sharing because it's easier to pronounce what actually it is the idea. Um, in divided societies such as Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia or Kosovo, if we are here in the region, a lot of people would believe that majoritarian democracy, where just the majority decides and the minority needs to take these decisions, is unacceptable because minorities will not accept this um, type of decision making. Accordingly, there is the idea that there should be a democratic regime type which is based on compromise, which is based on political inclusion of all different relevant groups of societies, all cultural groups, all majorities and minorities, and they should take decisions jointly. And in order to make this possible, the political elites, this means with political elites, we political scientists, others, the, just the office holders of, kind of, of these different groups, the political elites jointly should, should accommodate and kind of you know, build um, all encompassing compromises and govern this way. So, kind of, there should be an absolute avoidance of governing by any majoritarian decision making. All should be based on negotiations between the elites and on compromises. This is the core kind of you know, idea of consociational um, democracies and the definition thereof. Um, now, the literature has produced a number of critiques at consultation democracies. Essentially, one, um, the, the four points which I would like to quickly mention is that instead of providing for integration of society elite to segmentation, the third deepening of the split between the different communities, um, they have illiberal elements as they are. Um, emphasizing the identities and thereby kind of also locking individual citizens in their identities. Zedic Vinci might be a key word for the specialists of Bosnia and Herzegovina for this case. Um, I've mentioned that they are based on compromise between the elites, so it's actually not very democratic if you're not kind of building political decision making on the masses, but have a heavy, heavy emphasis on the elites, you de-democratize um, the um, societies. And last but not least, there is an empirical argument that power sharing or consultation which leads to a run to the extremes in elections, which is also called ethnic outbidding. They lead to a radicalization of the views because all the kind of you know, political parties would run only for um, to represent their own segment of societies, their own cultural group, and who will win within one of the kind of cultural groups within a majority or within a minority? Well, the one who speaks with the loudest, more radical voice. You can see it in many cases, and in Bosnia and Macedonia, Kosovo, only some of the cases where you can see it repeatedly in elections, that those who speak with the loudest, loudest more radical voices are um, winning the um, races. And essentially, this last element is very dangerous also for consultational democracies because the um, consultational element would actually require them to build on compromises between elites, but the democratic element, the electoral competition, leads to this race to the extremes which tends to destroy the compromise. Now, we have, um, if we build on these critiques, we would realize on the one hand that consociationalism has a lot of non-democratic elements. 
And um, with this last point, I also emphasize the point that the democratic element of, co of consultation democracies might undermine the consultational element. So it's quite straightforward to come to our next point to say there could also be a non-democratic type of consociations. And we have defined consociational democracies as democratic regimes based on the accommodation of elites. And, but we could also kind of you know, argue that elites and political inclusion does not actually require democracy. So we define conceptually consociational oligarchies and here comes the innovation of this project as, um, again, kind of we speak of, of political regimes in countries with deeply entrenched identities and cleavages, such as multi-ethnic, ethically divided societies, not necessarily, but these are the typical cases of, where we do have an agreement between the elites, compromise between the elites, but they are not democratic, they are hybrid regimes, so which are neither democracy nor dictatorships or authoritarian kind of countries or dictatorships. Um, now, there are a couple, easy to say, there are a couple of more fine-grained challenges I only want to very, very quickly um, point upon, which we need to resolve. Um, one of the problems is that we need to um, have a notion of democracy which we could connect to consensationalism so that there are no conceptual overlaps. And actually, as it turns out, um, most of the <coughs> operationalizations and concepts which are used today of democracy are so broad that there are some conceptual overlaps. As democracy, typically we would understand something that is not based on free and fair elections, which is on my x-axis, but also as um, countries with some constitutions, checks and balances, and so on. And so we would have fully authoritarian regimes as those cases which lack both, and fully democratic regimes are the cases which have both of these elements. And this would be, for instance, represented by the Quality 4 Index, which is the most frequently used index to measure democracy or non-democracy. But the problem which we have is the consensation of oligarchies by default need to have some constitutional elements, some checks and balances, some institutions, because you can't organize a power share, you can't organize a system where different sets of elites representing different groups have guaranteed power and um, have, have, have securities that they are included into governments, parliaments, and so on, taking care in decision making without giving them um, certain constitutional guarantees which moves them automatically a bit up on this um, vertical dimension which I have here on this map of democracy. And accordingly, if you would measure, for instance, democracy by the quality four index, um, consensational regimes would automatically range higher than the minimum um, of the quality four. And so um, there would always be kind of, you know, a bias already in any study which is trying to compare um, consensationalism and democracy in one way or the other. So in order to avoid any conceptual overlaps, we need to have a more reductionist, minimalist definition of democracy, which is based only on free and fair elections that kicks out all these constitutional aspects, checks and balances and so far. And we would do that by kind of um, using data on um, election fairness. Um, the, next, the second problem which we have is that there is um, often kind of, you know, previous work um, is, um, I'm trying to do my best, three minutes should work. Um, the, the previous work does actually, um, if, if it does not really distinguish between power sharing and democracy and autocracy, autocracies, but if um, they also assess power sharing or consensual in non-democracies, they use exactly the same elements as they do in, in, in democracies. And these are typically based on the, um, on the widespread institutional model of power sharing, which is based on four pillars. Proportional elections, grand coalitions, veto rights, so that minorities can veto decisions which they don't like, and group opponents. So typically that's federalism or some territorial autonomy. But the point is, some of these elements travel very well to dictatorships, but some of them just don't. Um, what is group autonomy or 
of federalism in a, um, in a, in a non-democratic regime, it's not very clear whether it really leads to the autonomy of these groups. The proportional electoral system in a one-party state just doesn't make, or it, it, it sometimes exists, but it doesn't really make sense. Um, so as a result, we need to reconceptualize what the, the kind of institutional elements of constitutional oligarchies are. Essentially, we look at different elements which relate to the way how the power in the capital is set up, which is our central government dimension. Here we would look at um, the um, way how the government is set up, we would look at parliaments and we would look at veto rights and at the military because we think that military and security force can play an important role in non-democracies and on the vertical dimension we would look at territorial kind of solutions. Um, so we have some very preliminary data that we try to map um, some examples thereof. Here you can see um, on the um, horizontal axis we have arranged the counters according to the degree all counters of the world, all heterogeneous countries of the world according to the freedom of elections. Um, on the left we have dictatorships, on the right we have um, countries with free and fair elections. And on the horizontal, on the vertical axis, we have the degree of power sharing in our two um, dimensions. And typical examples of concessional oligarchies would be on the left, on the top, um, Burundi in 2010, Madagascar, Ethiopia, Burundi in 1990. And on the right, we would have countries which would be closer to concessional democracies. We have the typical ones such as Bosnia and Herzegovina um, from 2000 on, Switzerland, Belgium, and um, so on and so forth. The point is that some, some of the points are not extremely sharp because our freedom of election measure is not as good. It's, it's, it, it avoids the conceptual problem, but it's not a very sharp measure because sometimes the election quality can fluctuate from one year to the other. So to summarize, um, we innovate with regards to the literature on authoritarian regimes. We introduce a new type of authoritarian rule, consultation of oligarchies, and um, with regards to the consensationalism literature, we extend it, ex extend it explicitly to non-democracies and to institutions of consensational oligarchies. Thanks a lot. Uh, it, it strengthened uh, 
the authoritarian tendency of the Erdogan regime. So from this kind of viewpoints, I'm going to ask you all two points, two questions. Um, firstly, you mentioned the foreign actor, uh, Russia in particular, as um, probably anti migrant um, power. And I suppose one of the features of migrant protests was the, this kind of existence of the foreign actor. And, uh, but how about the pro migrant side? So, uh, can you point out any specific um, foreign actors which actively support the, the migrant protest? That is, uh, I mean, the, the supporter of the civil society in Ukraine. And secondly, uh, you told us that informality or civil society was the key for the survival of Ukraine. Right. So how was the other side? Uh, it means the role of the formal institutions. Mm. For example, in the Turkish case, so yes, in case, every opposition party uh, failed to utilize this, that incident for their, for example, electoral uh, successes. In the Maiden, um, Maidan case, uh, is there an political party which joined the protest and or tried to utilize it for their political goals? So if there isn't, what was the reason of the absence of that kind of political party or uh, former institution? Yeah. So the, the existence or the absence of the, such kind of party contribute to promote the inclusive identity of Ukraine. This is the, uh, these two points are my question. And the second presentation uh, by Professor Chang, the, of course the, the OBOR is the, the one belt, one road initiative is one of the most known policies or strategies of China and the countries all over the world are paying attention to it. As our research in Turkey, which is a part of the belt, I personally also interested in, in this strategy of China. And you mentioned the US as an established superpower and China as an emerging great power, I guess. So uh, if the votes of the president, uh, the democratization of international relations means the increase of participation or the increasing uh, the level of participa participation, it's very easy to understand the Chinese idea. It means the China is uh, saying, uh, uh, stop treating me like a child. Right. So, is there any clear difference between this and the power-based analysis? So, you, you said it is a conventional theory that you challenge it, right? And I think, of course, the discourses of uh, some kind of behavior self are different, but the basic argument is almost the same. So, if we could state the difference more clearly, it might be uh, much nicer. Okay. This is another question about the uh, kind of comment. Then, oh, then uh, the third presentation of Professor Nestorovich's uh, presentation. Uh, yes, diaspora is always uh, important and, and problematic in many sense. Uh, so again, as for the Turkish case, uh, today the, the Votes of the Turkish citizens living outside of Turkey or abroad uh, have been quite important. The more than one million votes came from abroad for uh, this eight years the general election of Turkey, for example. And you pointed out the three roles of diaspora. One is Vodka and the other two. Or uh, economic ideas. Uh, 
And however, the Council of Diaspora seems to uh, I guess, uh, skip or somewhat ignore the, the political world of the diaspora. So what was done by uh, the Council of Diaspora for the political world of diaspora? So please share your experience and uh, observation with us. Then the second point is uh, and the diaspora, what kind of political roles are played today? So today's situation. For example, which political party is the most supported or uh, popular among uh, this uh, diaspora? If you have any idea, please tell me about it. And uh, its influence on the domestic policies of Serbia today, or and. Uh, the former Yugoslavian Republic at that time. Oh, a bit short. But, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for putting you back Then, uh, can I ask uh, uh, sorry, here to give a comment to uh, uh, Daniel? Uh, but you can see there that the Thank you very much. Um, I will stay seated because I've done my uh, 300 steps that I do with it. <laughs> um, right, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I enjoyed reading the paper. I, I think it's a very interesting idea you have. Um, personally, I think you're looking at it from the wrong angle. Right? And I'll, I'll talk you through my comments and then I'll come back to that. I think conceptually the theory is very interesting because it clearly is, 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 is a general recognition in the literature that conversational democracies tend to be undemocratic or certainly have undemocratic features. You've given some examples, and that's not new. That's, you know, I mean, Donald Horowitz has built a career around that point, right? So um, I think that's quite interesting. I think what you are trying to do is take that to the next level and say not only are all democratic. Uh, Conversational systems partly undemocratic. That would be the case also in Belgium and in Switzerland. But there are also what we would consider undemocratic regimes that have conversational features, right? And I think that's quite interesting. And I think that's maybe the better way to look at it, right? To start at it with a regime type rather than with a conversational type. Um, I think, again, some of the things that you bring up in the paper, um, especially at the beginning, are, are things which have been well established, like you talk about the peace versus democracy paradigm, or I would call it the peace slash stability versus democracy paradigm, which if you look at the peace building literature, is well established, people like Roland Perez, David Chandler, Francis Fukuyama, Timothy Sis, all these people have written on that and, and have demonstrated how difficult it is to build democracies and indeed build political institutions in divided societies, particularly after, after country. So I urge you to look a little bit into the peace building literature of people like Roland Harris or Timothy uh, Sis. Um, I think where I see some issues is uh, in, in the coding exercise. Because the coding exercise you've done brings in some very odd cases. Right? I mean, in the paper you justify why the UK is in there. I mean, wow, classifying the UK as a power sharing system, the first time I ever hear that. I mean, you know, good luck to them do that in Edinburgh or see how that goes down with this cause. You know, when they hear they, they, they are properly represented in London. But the problem is the way you measure it, right? You, you measure that there is an office for Scotland, right? Um, which has no power is occupied by a person who represents a party that is an absolute minority party in Scotland and has literally no influence. Right? To say that any form of elite power sharing in, in, in the UK, I think, is highly problematic. The other obvious case that jumped in my face is, is Myanmar. Right? To say there's such a thing as territorial autonomy in Myanmar, wow. I mean, you know, as somebody who's worked in the country a lot, the 2008 constitution is not only one of the more worst constitutions I've read in my life, but it's one of the highly centralized constitutions I've read about. 
right? It has this nice division of powers, and then it has an article that says, if there is a conflict, the center is always white, right? So the central government can overrule any minority region at any time, and they do. That's also a practical thing. So I think the problem is how you code it. And this is, I think again in your presentation you mentioned that you use a very minimalistic definition of democracy, right? By focusing just on electoral democracy, right? That's why Bosnia ends up with such a high democracy score, right? So all of a sudden you tell us Bosnia in 2000 was, you know, a reasonably good function democracy, right? I mean, everybody here who works in Bosnia would question that, let's say that. Um, and then you go to the four elements that we consider of confiscationism, and you tell us, well, two of those I can't really measure, because these are non democratic regimes. And part of the non democratic nature means there's no proper elections and there's no proper federalism. So you end up using two out of four elements of confiscationism, and only one element that makes a major democracy. And I'm finding, you know, you get to a point where you say, well, it's a very minimalist definition of democracy. It's a very minimalist definition of confiscation regimes. So, you know, the correlation we see here becomes very problematic because you're leaving out a very important fact, right? So the way I would look at it is I would turn it on its head and say this is not so much about confiscationism and that can occur in, in democracies, hybrid regimes and authoritarian regimes. Which I think you also need to define clearer in the paper. What do you mean by hybrid regime, authoritarian regimes? There is a whole literature on that. Um, but I think I would look at it the other way around. I would say there are hybrid regimes and indeed fully fledged authoritarian regimes that nevertheless use elements of confiscation. Right? First of all, if you can prove that, I think that would be an interesting finding. Right? And I think there your data might be useful. And B, then of course the question becomes why? Right? Why would an, uh, you know, a, 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 a hybrid regime or indeed a fully authoritarian regime use elements of conversation? The, the danger that I always see with uh, 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 a statistical approach like this is you know you will have, you will find that you know if you take Stalin Soviet Union right there's a high amount of power sharing in there because Stalin made sure that the key positions in the Soviet Union were people from different nationalities right uh, and here in South of Georgia you should forget right so um, you 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 might end up with a system where you say well even here I find uh, you know power sharing so my impression that I got when I read the paper is a little bit. Uh, uh, the death, the danger that you know Daniel Alazar did in the late years of his life, right? I mean, the first pieces he wrote on feminism is some of the most excellent work on feminism that existed, but in his later life he saw feminism everywhere he looked, right? And, and he tried to explain to Puerto Rico, you ask his feminism, and he then wrote a whole book on why the Israelites were the first feminists, right? So, uh, I think the danger is when we minimize definitions, we end up with inclusion of cases which, you know, then makes the whole sample quite problematic. Anyway, that was enough comments for the whole panel. So, <laughs> um, but just once, and I do think the idea is interesting, but I do think maybe the coding you need to think about, I mean, you said it yourself in the presentation that there are some things you still need to, need to think about, and, and that's what comes into my mind. I'll stop here, because otherwise I might get short. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Very reasonable questions. So, very shortly, I'll put it this way. I think that the real test for the foreign actors was even not at the time of the Maidan itself, but at the time of, no, it's called war, or like an open military conflict. And what we know for sure now, that when uh, this Crimean operation, or let's call it this way, started, the new, newly appointed post-Maidan government in Kiev immediately called foreign embassies, means US embassy, German embassy, and in both cases they said, please do nothing, we'll take care of it. And we know the end of the story. So we have a relatively peaceful annexation of Crimea, and not at all peaceful war in Donbass, more than 10,000 people killed, so why it's, it's, it's like never-ending story. Um, uh, and actually, I should also mention that a lot of 
colleagues of mine expected Turkey to be much more active in case of Crimea, reasonably historical aspect, Crimea and Tata are mostly in group and so on, and as we know it never happened. Like in, in terms of real politics in spring 2014. I'm talking about civil society, again I want to stress that uh, civil society in Ukrainian debates, this term is usually used like purely positive, uh, which is also kind of a dangerous thing, because quite often you have like far right groups, you yeah, know, whatever. They're also civil society, of course, no doubt about it. So I'll put it this way. The best example when civil society kind of replaced state was of course the first stage of war in Donbass, when literally so-called activists collected money, bought different stuff for Ukrainian army or volunteer battalions to fight there. But then it stopped, like now it's done more or less by the state itself. But there was a kind of a couple of months, but it was literally done mostly by different Nazi groups in the civil society. It was pretty impressive. At the same time, you're right, I can also say that there, there was or there still is no political party, let's say, coming out of the Maidan. So there are different like, personalities related to the experience of this protest, whatever, but we have no Maidan or post Maidan party, which on the one hand, rightly so, helps to keep this Maidan experience open, pluralistic, whatever, again, like from far right to like Methodist groups. On the other hand, poses a serious question actually why? Why this movement has not like, ended up in a kind of a structured political project? And apparently, my answer would be because it was actually too broad and not even just political. It was kind of you know, like a very broad movement, kind of an attempt to imagine new Ukraine, which to a large extent failed, to some extent maybe not, it depends. But even in the next elections, yes, yeah, so or next year, uh, we have again, we have no party or political group that will define itself as a Maidan party. They will all pretend to be in Maidan party, but it's not the same, of course. So this question remains open. And thank you very much again. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, on the question of the work that was wrote, uh, I think uh, I, I wrote uh, a piece on the intellectual basis of the work that was wrote. And uh, before I came here, I was in DC. We had uh, endless uh, discussion, so I would like to escape this question and forward this topic and when we have dinner and have more chat on this question. I directly go to the second question. Yes, you are right. I'm challenging the power base and this is in the organizations and also in internal politics as well. Yet power is a very fascinating variety. Right? Everybody would be interested in and like that. Uh, and for, uh, for the result, yes, yes how is it probably the most important rivalry. I do not disagree with that. The problem is uh, disproportionately power has been given um, I think disproportionate uh, emphasis and my view is idea methods. So in, in this specific case between China and the United States, people are talking about power shift, shift or something like shift. And it really the power really shifted after two of eight when the Lehman Brothers collapsed and the real balance collapsed. But intellectually, it happened earlier. Today we are witnessing a lot of change, U.S. trade war, or uh, the, the, the confrontation on job politics, etc., etc. Et but it, it can be dated, dated back early and mentioned uh, and the and NPT, non proliferation system, and North Korean nuclear issue, for me, is a very good uh, harbinger for us to assess the Chinese perception change to the international order. So, for example, in the 1990s, China was very supportive of the number of liberation system. It did a very good joint activity. It created so many internal systems, uh, bureaucracies, and also training personnel. Look, what Chen was not, not only for not long, but also the uh, understanding of NPT. For example, the one Chinese uh, um, um, disarmament uh, uh, experts he explained that. Uh, a uh, non-proliferation should include several important elements, not only denuclearization of specific country, it should also include the nuclear disarmament of the United States. If you do not disarm yourself, you ask other people to, to denuclearize, it will be unfair. And what the second one important is a uh, missile proliferation. You know, from 1998, the United States uh, increased the deployment of missiles, both in Europe 
and in Asia. So from the view of the Chinese understanding of MPT, the United States is destroying the system it built by itself. So the problem is that you are going to regulate other the so-called rogue states who are going to regulate and take the big role if, if we can exert the world. So this is a fundamental intellectual divergence for me. And this problem they are um, developed into the Iraqi war. They have very different understanding toward war because that war was so controversial without the United Nations Security Council resolution and we done. And before that, Kosovo was also done by the United Nations. So these for the Chinese, it, it seems to be unfair international order. So how to make the order more representative? This is fundamental intellectual problems. So this problem I think remain today, how to reconcile is a big question. Thank you for the questions. Uh, concerning the first one, uh, what we did, this is uh, a very important question. In fact, it was uh, quite difficult to work because you have to imagine the configuration at that time, and especially the three persons who were in charge of this. The president was uh, Vojislav Kostunica, maybe you remember him. The Prime Minister of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia is very little known, Dragi Šepešić, uh, coming from Montenegro. And the third one is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Goran Svilanović. So we have three persons who are in charge of this, and all of them have a completely different agenda concerning diaspora. Meaning, is it good? Is it bad? Should we accept? Should we refuse? Should we use them or not? So there are plenty of politics concerning this. We are in 2001, so it is just after the bombing, and uh, there are many discussions about what will be the future for this country. On top of this, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was the nominal state, but in fact the two republics had the most power uh, within the Federation. So it was quite difficult and uh, I think that the basic, uh, not misunderstanding, but the basic uh, difference in treatment is that the people from diaspora were looking for a, a political participation here, while the people from inside were only looking at the economic benefit coming from diaspora. So there was a huge, huge uh, uh, miscommunication uh, between the two bodies. So at the end of the day, the only, I would say, visible accomplishment is the fact that we can vote a vote. Uh, this is something that we didn't have before. So you can vote abroad, but only in the consulate, not concerning uh, remote voting. And uh, we also petition, and this is what we obtained from the Minister of Defense at that time, Nebu Shaparkovic, uh, we petitioned, we lobbied hard with him in order to exclude the people from abroad to serve in the army. Because at that time, we didn't know what would be the situation in the country, and people were afraid uh, to send their children because they were afraid if they would be engaged in the army or in an, any conflict. So, that's where the accomplishment, I would say, not very much. But not because there was not the willingness coming from the diaspora. It is because within the country we did not have a political willingness coming from the political authorities. The second question about what is happening today, we have uh, an administration concerning diaspora within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And that's the first problem that we ask it. Why should it be within the foreign affairs? We are not foreigners. We should not be uh, linked to the foreign affairs ministry. We should have our own ministry or to be within anything else, but not with the foreign affairs. But this is what is happening today. And today the, uh, the, uh, the director of this uh, uh, administration for diaspora affairs is uh, a civil servant who is uh, appointed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, so there is no involvement coming from diaspora. While in the Council we were on parity 11 11, and the President must come from abroad. So it means that today we have very little visibility. Contrary to 2001, there was a kind of enthusiasm about the idea. So people still continue to send remittances, but uh, 
the uh, political engagement has faded away dramatically. So we don't have at all the enthusiasm that we used to have in 2001. And leaving my next uh, discussion, Professor David, to answer. Um, thanks for these very sharp points, sir. sir. Um, it's, um, it helps us kind of, you know, to, to really the paper and rethink what we need to do better. Although I disagree on, on, on the most critical points, I kind of tend to disagree with you. By your standards, um, the probably kind of least controversial conversational country kind of Switzerland also should be classified as a conversation, at least when it comes then with regards to kind of being conversational with regards to the language groups. And now kind of you know you, you were heavily criticizing the inclusion of the UK. Because Switzerland is exactly like the UK with regards to the kind of four life parking kind of you know power sharing pillars. You have guaranteed representation of the language groups in Parliament as you have in the UK um, because you have territorial electoral districts. Um, you don't have in Switzerland guaranteed representation of the language groups in um, government as you don't have the de facto always have ministers from Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland as you do have in Switzerland. And so on and so forth. We could put exactly the same. So, by your kind of you know, standards, which you would like to apply to the coding, you would need to, you would be so orthodox that you would kind of kick out the kind of, you know, deep, one of the prime examples of conversationalism from conversational democracy from all codes. So, I, I like to set the kind of, you know, threshold very high. But I'm afraid, especially on the conversational democracy side, we cannot be much better than kind of you know, previous measures which um, were there. The problem is that we need to kind of code formal, um, descriptive kind of you know, representation inclusion. It's very hard to kind of you know, code the spirit of compromise which we would like to get to. And these rights are extremely rare. These would be the strongest power share institution, but they are so rare that they are close to inexistent. Two more points about the kind of, you know, conceptual issues. Um, it's not true that we, what we do is just the same, but how Horowitz and so on have been doing. They have all kind of, you know, been arguing for a, a range of similar critiques, and we, we build on that, we recognize that work, we cite it, but they always kind of, you know, speak as critiques of power sharing, conversationalism has, a little bit kind of, you know, is, 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 is not such as a good quality of democracy. They will never doubt that these cases can be non-democratic. We are making exactly this step. We are distinguishing this kind of critique, which is adverse in aspects of the quality of, of, of power sharing democracies, that they are maybe not so kind of 100% democratic to kind of say, okay, we can move this outright into the kind of sphere of regimes which are non-democratic, whereby we define that, I think we do that in the paper, we have a whole section about the measure of um, democracy, about cases which have no free and fair elections. And last but not least, the kind of peace versus democracy um, literature which you mentioned, yes, this is absolutely not new. But this is not the way how we kind of you now build the trade-off. The usual trade-off um, about peace versus democracy is telling democratization can be dangerous. We say something else. We say we have a very kind of you know stable, peaceful, potentially kind of you know regime, the regime types, conversational oligarchies which resemble kind of you know this power sharing type which everybody has been thinking of as a democracy. That they are um, not only stable in terms of being peaceful, but they are also stable in terms of not um, democratizing. So it's a completely different argument from, from the one which you cite. And Myanmar, I completely agree with you. Luckily, that's not our own coding, but I need, would need to go back into this case because it shouldn't be there where it is to see kind of, you know, why it goes there, and we have some new data which we have coded on this project, which hopefully will help us to correct for this. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, we, we start to, uh, as you can see, the ten minutes late, so we have uh, 12 minutes for discussion. So, please take your time. Thank you. Uh, 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 
Dr. Nestorovich, uh, you, you obviated my question with your first answer. I was going to ask about stories of diaspora disillusionment, but I think you covered that pretty well. Um, uh, to Dr. Portnoff, uh, just an anecdote from 2004 about the, the differentiation. I mean, it, uh, there, were, there were two dynamics during the, during the Maidan crisis that, were, that looked like they might outstrip the democracy narrative. Uh, one was the separatism narrative. You remember that conference in, in, in Lugansk uh, where, where Lushkov came and so forth. And this scared the hell out of the EU. There was a lot of toing and froing and, and, and Solana came. And uh, it became about, oh, how do we avoid a conflict with the Russians or with the, Ru the Russian aligned oblasts? Uh, not, there was an election stolen and, uh, and so forth. Um, but then there was the, 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 the fear of the conflict dynamic, and I saw, at least in my own experience, I was there for six months during the Orange Revolution, you couldn't get people to fight with each other. You could at most get them to shout at each other, but even the folks who were brought in by train from Donetsk and Lugansk and Kharkiv, at, within 10 minutes of shouting each other slogans, they'd be asking for a light and getting a beer and standing, and then standing in their respective, it took a lot of inducement from without to create the conflict. So I, 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 I agree with your, your, your framing of that. Uh, to Dr. Boxler, there's a lot of parallels between your research and, and, and the, doc, the doctoral dissertation I'm doing. Um, I would say that, you know, at least in Bosnia's case, it's a competitive oligarchy. You can have, you can have actors, uh, Tamila Radovic is perhaps the clearest example because he wasn't one of the founding fathers of the system, but he demonstrates the incentives outlive the founders of the system. He, his whole riff has been, I could, I could protect the prerogatives of the RS better than the party that brought you Srebrenica because I, I wasn't involved in that. Um, so I call these peace cartels, effectively. We, we can threaten the peace if you threaten our rule, effectively. It works very well with us international factors, and because they can leverage fear, it also works well domestically. Uh, and so I think that that is the uh, the democracy versus peace element that, that, is, that is most trenchant in that particular case. And uh, there's one final thought. One thing that didn't come up here that I think it may sort of be useful looking forward to your research as it goes, goes on is there's democracy and there's pluralism. I'd say in the authoritarian umbrella that you're operating, you could have, you could have greater pluralism in an authoritarian regime that's not, not democratic, but it can still have consociate, consociational elements, as, as Soren mentioned. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Thank you. Is there any question or comment on the floor? I think, okay, then there are last questions. Could you answer? Okay, very, very quickly. So thank you very much. Uh, that's my question as well. And I should just tell you that, first of all, details are very important for the outbreak of any conflict. So Ukraine, Bosnia, whatever. And really to look at like, what happened on the exact day, for instance. Or even like a particular minute of time set. And we probably know that about, for instance, again, Donetsk and Lugansk, yeah, in spring 2014, we probably know. And I just want to tell you that one of my projects, ongoing projects, that I don't even like, would like to do, to write a big article, maybe even a small book, more or less like how war breaks out, and to look very closely at what happened in Donetsk and Mugansk in 2014. Actually, why? Because I also remember very well I'm talking to people, friends of mine, just colleagues, who would always say, we don't believe that like, war is impossible. It makes no sense, it will never happen, because, because, because we have this experience with certain four and so on. And then still it happened. And now that's a very reasonable question to look like, how and why and who are the actors who have produced it? And I'm sure that such knowledge will help us a lot, also thinking about global order or other like, problematic uh, parts uh, yeah, of the continent. Because now, when it's like ongoing, it's of course much more difficult to stop it and to start something new. So, and that's why, yeah, I think we, we need a very serious, in-depth, uh, let's say, local research. Very much local research, looking at the local actors, their behavior, doing oral history and stuff like that. And I do hope that at some point we'll have, maybe we'll have a special conference comparing different parts of Ukraine 
uh, being screened in 2014, and looking, for instance, why in some places physical violence really broke up in some other places, but we also those actors and attempts and whatever, and it went more or less history. And that's a fascinating question, of course, to be uh, discussed both in the history of sociologically and maybe even uh, psychologically. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for the insights. Bosnia is not, it's not the first case to people who are familiar with Bosnia associated case with our concept. Although I'm not really sure whether it actually is the, is the kind of a good case. I think as of 2000, people who are assessing the freedom and fairness of election would say these are reasonably free and fair, they are getting close to a democracy. It's not a full democracy, but kind of, you know, we can have, we can have government change, which is produced in a very reasonably to voters as early can you know, want to change the power. And therefore, it would um, have all these features, kind of, you know, which we would say kind of are the liberal, kind of where we would criticize the way how Bosnian democracy works, which are could be potentially typical for constitutional democracies, but it wouldn't be a non-democracy by this this account. And with regards to the pluralism, um, pluralism within um, the um, segments. Um, would kind of you know be a way of 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 of, of producing kind of you know this this competition um, which is needed for democracy. However, you have a different form of pluralism which you do have for Afghanistan, where you have representatives and political parties of different groups, or as you have in Burundi, where you have different parties who are representing either the Hutus and the two or the Tutsis, um, and. This is also a form of pluralism. Pluralism tells us, or as in kind of, you know, Colombia of the 1950s, where you had two different kind of, you know, um, economic sectors which were also engaging in a type of power sharing agreement, although there was nothing kind of, you know, like a democracy, um, full democracy there, um, which were representing two different economic segments and kind of, you know, um, very deeply entrenched kind of, you know, worldviews. That's also a form of pluralism, which you have kind of, you know, between different segments of society, but within each of these segments of society, you are not kind of, you know, free to pick who you want to vote for, but you are aligned with kind of, you know, your um, elites who are supposed to represent you. This is the reason why I believe pluralism can be used in so many different ways, and it does not capture um, our notion of what we would understand as democracy, which is that there is a genuine control of those who are in government, those who are the elites, by kind of you know um, people who they are represent, they can change them, and this is our kind of you know notion of minimal notion of democracy, which we need to.
can I stop the video now?